My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway murders Facebook group together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to this bonus episode of Mind Over Murder. As many of you know, the month of April marks the anniversary of the disappearance and presumed murder of Keith Call and Cassandra Haley. We thought we would bring back this episode from May 2021 with Chris Call and Joyce Call Canada discussing their brother's disappearance as well as the disappearance of Cassandra Sandy Haley. Keith and Sandy were on a first date in April 1988 when they went missing. As always, thanks for listening and enjoy this episode of Mind Over Murder. We are joined today by Chris Call and Joyce Call Canada, siblings of Keith Call. Chris and Joyce, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. You're welcome. So Chris is in Florida and Joyce is in Virginia at an undisclosed location. (laughs) We think Joyce has uh, locked herself away in a closet or something. She said she was looking for the quietest spot in her house. (laughs) I found it. (laughs) I'm hiding. Welcome. We're we're glad to have you both. Let's actually go ahead and start off by talking about what are, are some of the words that you would use to describe Keith as a person. Kind, caring, fun, responsible, all over good guy. I agree. And I like to always go in there, too, because this is part of him that I remember. He was a little jokester, too. He did. He liked to do his little pranks. He liked to have fun. He was fun-loving. Most of the time, he seemed pretty upbeat and happy. Glad and to be alive. Hard. Loved life. Hard-working. Yeah. Dedicated. Yeah. And I want to make sure that we clarify what, what age order are y'all in your family? And it's not just the two of you. You have a couple of other family members as well. So can you clarify the age order? Where was Keith in the family line? Keith was right below me. Joy's the oldest. I'm the second oldest. And then there was Keith. And then there was Doug. And then Stephen is the youngest. I think because of... Keith passing away so young, I move him into the youngest slot, but he's actually right in the middle of five. Yes. Well, Stephen was how old when when this happened, Joy? Steve was eight. Eight when it happened. Yes, Stephen was very young, yes. So all of you remember him, but Stephen was quite young when Keith disappeared. What was the family dynamic like? What was the life like with the five calls and and your mom and dad? What was the family like at home? I will say during that time, we were busy. We were just a normal family. I actually wasn't living at home. I had had moved out. Keith was going to school full-time and and working. He had a part-time job for almost full-time. Everyone was just busy doing what we're supposed to be doing. Mom was a housewife. Dad was working at Anheuser-Busch. I think Doug was maybe still in school. Doug was still in school. So it was just a normal, somewhat normal um, home, <laughs> home, somewhat. <laughs> Joyce, what were you doing during that time? So at th- that time, I was already married and I lived, I don't know, probably about 10 minutes from my mom and dad, the family home. So really just what Chris said, everybody was just doing their thing. When I look back, I, I thought we were a pretty close-knit family, just everybody doing what they were supposed to be doing, or sometimes not what they were supposed to be doing. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but we were a family, and we knew what was pretty much what was going on with everybody. Now, with- who would you say Keith related to best in the family? Was, was there somebody who like he was just best buddies with, or was he Mr. All-Around Nice Guy? It was really he and the, Stephen, they were very close at the time. There was such a big age gap kind of too. So they were very close. And with the older kids, even though you were living a, out of the house, would you go back for holidays, Thanksgiving? Oh, I was only like eight, eight minutes away. <laughs> and so. I was 10, <laughs> 10 minutes away. So they couldn't get rid of us. 
<laughs> so you'd be back to stop in or for dinners or different things like that? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yes. And I was usually when I would uh, go over and have coffee with mom in the morning and have breakfast with her a lot. Yeah, we were there. They could. We were there a lot. It was yeah, like it was- our home was like the hub. Mom and dad's home was like the hub. And we would meet up there. Yes. That was before Keith and Cassandra were killed. After that, it was totally different. Prior to that, everything was was like the hub. What do you all recall about the day that Keith went on his date with Cassandra? Had you seen him that day? Were you aware that he and Cassandra were going out on a date that night? I was very much aware because he stopped by my house on the way out. I lived at Gloucester Point, and he stopped by my place on his way to pick up Cassandra to borrow a, I think, a sweater and a jacket. And I hate to say this, but I actually ended up buying them a case of beer. I've always felt guilty about that because they had just recently changed the drinking age from 18 to 21. So I did do that. So I always felt guilty about that. But they would have got someone else to do it if it wasn't for me. So Let's stay with the beer for a second. Chris, people have asked a lot of questions online about the beer because in some of the crime scene photos of Keith's car, the beers, or at least the tops of the beer cans, are visible. Is there any chance 33 years later you'd remember what brand of beer it was? I think Bush. Which your dad worked at the Anheuser-Busch factory, correct? I think it was a Bush beer. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think it was a 12-pack. I think it was a 12-pack. Would Keith have had beer that night? I know there was a, there's some question about this, and I figured we're talking about it. Would Keith have been drinking that night, in your opinion? He might have had a little bit, but I don't think he was a very big drinker. I think he was just doing it because he was going to a party and didn't want to go empty-handed kind of thing. Right. Uh, I don't think he would do much heavy drinking and driving. He was very responsible. And the borrowing of the clothes, was that more of a, you were his fashionable older brother and he wanted to look sharp for this date? Uh, Perhaps it could be that, or he just needed to borrow a jacket and a sweater. And I forgot about that until a few years ago, one of the FBI agents, I forget, maybe like in 2012, I met him somewhere and he actually had that jacket and sweater and I forgot, totally forgot about it. And like, whoa, really took me back. That's scary. Weird. And this was an agent had the items of clothing that were probably left in Keith's Toyota Celica? Yes, it was. And then we met someplace in Newport News, some little restaurant that he pulled them out. I guess he wanted me to identify him. And I had forgot all about it. And I was like, whoa, yeah, they were mine that he was wearing that night. Do you remember what they it was? A, I think it was like a Benetton sweater that had maybe B34. Then I think it was like a, a guess. Jean jacket, they were very popular back then. Mm -hmm. Jean jacket, they had like maybe the leather on the shoulders or something. It it was the 80s, so late 80s. (laughs) Fashionable, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) I'm so glad you said that. And of course, young people's clothes did have a certain look. People have have commented on Sandy's look as well. And we're like, wait a minute, you got to remember with the big hair and the outfits, it was very much the 80s. That's right, very much the 80s. And I want to make sure that we do get a little clarification here about Keith and his dating life. This was his first date with Cassandra, but he did have a long-term girlfriend, Selena. Can either of you guys speak to his relationship with Selena and why she wasn't the person with him at the party that night? Do you want to take that, Joy? Well, from what I understand, it, they had just taken a break. They, I think they had separated like two weeks before this. They were supposedly just taking a break. Now, I wasn't all up into what he was doing with his love life at that time. I just knew that those two had been together for a long, for that young of age. They've been together for quite a while. Like the ninth grade or something. Yeah, and they were always together. She was at at our house a lot, mom and dad's house, dinner all. And they were just always together. And yeah, it was just like the two weeks they had been apart. I guess he was just trying to go out and spread his wings a little bit. I don't know. Do you know any more than that, Chris? Oh, I think you got it kind of right. They were just trying to, I think they had a little spat and they said, but we're going to try other people. And I think before, I think they already were talking about getting back together. So I remember it was very hard on Selena, very hard. We've talked to Selena as well recently, and she was going to school and Keith was going to Christopher Newport. 
And so the distance may have played a little bit of a... She was going to school in Norfolk. She went to ODU. Yeah, it was it was ODU, but I do remember some connection to Elon. I know that, and maybe it's she was at a party with some friends that went to Elon mm-hmm. the night that this happened. I knew there was an Elon connection there, there, there somewhere, is. and so this wasn't really any kind of bitter breakup then, from what you recall. No, no, it wasn't. When I look back on that, to me, at me at that age, they were just so much more responsible than I was. I would have been just like, I'll show you or, and they were, <laughs> had talked about, had talked about this and then they were talking and they were deciding they were just going to take a few weeks apart. And then they were talking about getting together and they were, I don't know, when I look back on it, I was like, he was so much more mature. <laughs> they Joy, don't more. You, Joy, don't you remember, we used to always say though, that they were almost inseparable, that he almost needed to take a break from her because no matter where he was, she was. Oh yeah, they were. Always high yeah. school and, and Jess, we were joking. Yeah, so. but because we always loved Selena. Yes. I mean, she, she, we did. Joyce, you said to me at one point, you thought they might have gotten married. It seemed like it was leading in that direction to me. Like Chris was just saying, they were inseparable. inseparable. They were together all the time, unless yeah. he was working or at school. I think they even alluded to and um, being they might get engaged or something. So perhaps they would have been married. Who knows? So then how did Keith meet Sandy? How did they know each other? From Christopher Newport. I think they were in the same math class. They were were friends. From what I understood, they had met and they had a class or two together. We had never even heard of uh, Cassandra Haley before this night. I hate that we've had to find out about her this way. She did seem like a wonderful young lady. Yes. had a full life ahead of her, too. A way to meet a family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Chris, we know that you saw Keith that evening. Joy, did you see him at any point during that day? No, I had not seen Keith. It was Sunday, but the last time I saw Keith, it was actually Easter Sunday. We were standing around at the kitchen table. I think I was sitting there, and I remember this so well because he was leaning up against the counter, and I was just sitting there just talking to him, just shooting the you know what? And uh, I said, Keith, what do you think about that girl, Lori Ann, that just got murdered? Because that was a talk of it's a small town. And he says, oh, my God. He says, I knew her. I didn't know her, but we went to school together. And we were talking about that. And he said, God, I hope nothing like that ever happens to me. He said those words to me and I have never forgot. And it was uh, Easter Sunday. And that was the last time that I saw him. So he referenced Lorianne Powell's disappearance and murder a week. That happened to Keith on Saturday night. And I saw him the Sunday before. And it had happened. I don't know the exact time right now, but it was in that time frame a week or two before that. I thought Lorianne Powell was a little bit later. Lorianne Powell was before Keith. Oh. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Kristen, am I not mistaken then that Brian Pettinger comes after yeah. Keith and Sandy's yeah. disappearance? And Andy it's Fox has Andy Fox has done some recent reporting on Lorianne Powell and Brian Pettinger's murders, which are separate events, but they both are connected to Liberty Security, and they bracket the disappearance yeah. of Keith and Sandy. They're on either side, and then of course oh, you, you have the, you have the disappearance, and then of course their bodies were found later. Where were you both on the day when you got the news that Keith had not come home from the party the night before? I was at home. I was at my house in Gloucester. And I can remember it was a a nice Sunday morning and I was already out and about. And I think I was planning a cookout for that afternoon because it was so nice outside that day sunny and everything and then it was and so I remember it was about 9 30 in the morning and I got a phone call and it was from my mom. She was very upset. She just was saying that she got this weird phone call from somebody from the park service saying that they had found Keith's car, Keith's car on the parkway, but he wasn't there. And first she hung up on him because she thought it was some kind of terrible prank. And why would somebody do that? And then they called back and then she was really upset. And that's when she called me. They were heading down to the parkway after she called me. And then that's when I started heading down there. And I guess the same with you, Chris. Right at the foot of the bridge. So it didn't take me any time to get there. 
So. so let's see if we can nail this down a little bit. So did both your parents go to the parkway? Joyce, you went, and Chris, you also went. Yeah, and I'm sure Dad, who worked at the brewery, he showed up not too long after that. I'm sure they got in touch with him. And I don't, I, I guess Mom, I don't remember when Mom got there, but I'm sure she, she was there. I don't yeah. know if she was there before I got there or not, but she was there. Did you go to the York River Overlook where Keith's car was found? Yes. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Tell us what you saw, who was there. I know it's 33 years later, but to the best of your recollection, tell us what was going on. I remember seeing, of course, the the Park Service cars everywhere. I remember seeing cops everywhere. There were helicopters flying over, if I remember correctly, at least one or two. They had the cadaver dogs, the search dogs. I don't remember if the news was there already, but the news showed up soon. A lot of commotion, a lot of people, a lot of people. Was Keith's car visible? Could you see the Toyota there at the pole? I don't remember. They had towed it up. I don't remember if they towed it already by, by the time I got there or they towed it while I was there. And I remember even thinking then, it was like, why are they messing with this car? That's stupid. It's more than likely a crime scene. So it's like they didn't waste any time taking it to the, uh, I know where they took it to was on the Park Service headquarters, which is right on 17 near the intermediate school. So it was stored in there for quite a while. Joyce, do you remember seeing the car at York River over? No, I don't. I remember coming over the bridge and I felt sick to my stomach. And I remember getting to the parkway and I do remember seeing all kinds of crime scene tape. They were already there because they lived closer. Chris and my mom and all them. And a lot of people were already there. And I was just, I was actually just in shock and dazed because you don't, I know it sounds cliche, but you don't really think anything like this is ever going to happen to your family. And I was just walking around dazed. There was all kinds of people around asking questions. And I do remember the yellow tape being out, but I don't remember any specific. Terry Haley, who has some law enforcement experience for the first few years of her professional life, her recollection is that she was upset. She felt like the scene was chaotic and uncontrolled from her point of view. Did it feel that way when you got there? How how did things feel when you arrived on scene? It felt very unorganized and it felt i don't know if i really felt it then but now it felt like they were trying to screw the scene up as i remember trying to speak to some of the park service people and i think terry haley might have been with me and i remember i'll never forget this as long as i live we were trying to i was trying to explain to this park ranger that i was on the park just a few hours earlier about four in the morning and trying to tell him what i saw and i'll never forget that this park ranger his eyes were bloodshot he looked like he'd been up all night or been on been high or something And he could have cared less what I was telling him. And I think it was Terry Haley with me. We looked at each other and said, oh, that's really weird. Never forgot that moment. My stomach did flips and was like, this is weird. And there was something to do with some rope or some cord. And we were showing it to him or something. And he could have cared less. It's always gave me the creeps. And I always thought to myself, he has something to do with this. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Mind Over Murder. What had you seen on the parkway a couple of hours earlier that made you feel like you needed to talk to this park service ranger right away? Go ahead and give us the story on that. What I saw was I was coming back from Richmond. It was a Russian Orthodox Easter service. They go very late. We were coming off 64, driving down the parkway. As we get into the area where Keith's car was found, just prior, I would say a little west of that, maybe the Ringfield parking lot. I think that's the name of that picnic area. You drive by it every day, I think, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember a vehicle coming out of the woods and it was a van and it looked like a dark colored van. That van accelerated quickly. The speed limit on the parkway is 45 miles an hour. I know that. Because it's the one and only place I've ever got a speeding ticket in my life was on the Colonial <laughs> Parkway. Oh, great. So I know that. And I remember remarking to my friend Ethan, who was driving, I turned around and looked and I said, that vehicle must be doing 70 or 80 miles an hour behind us. Speed limit's only 45. What's going on? It's, it was weird. I never forgot that. And then I remember there, it's driving behind us. And obviously, there's no traffic on the parkway at four in the morning. And as we get past where there is a car parked with the, tr- looked like the trunk was open or maybe the dome light was, oh, was on. 
and the vehicle slowed down and did a U-turn or turned into the next turn off and went back the other direction. So very what- weird, very creepy. And there's a 99.9% chance that was my brother's car sitting right there. And being that there's no lights on the parkway, you wouldn't tell. So let's see if we can pin this down because there's been a lot of discussion in the past few weeks, believe it or not, about this exact incident, Chris. People are very interested in your experience. So does that mean you think that the dark colored van pulled out of the Ringfield plantation, Mm -hmm. which is wooded, and then followed you probably then for a couple of miles? So it would have gone past the Cheetah Mannix overlook where Kathy's Honda had been found. Mm -hmm. And then continued, and then I think we have to go about another mile, ballpark, to the turnoff called the York River Overlook where Mm -hmm. Keith's car was found. So does that mean that the dark colored van was behind you and Ethan for two miles or so? Is that fair? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And they never never made an attempt to pass you or anything like that. (laughs) They had been going fast. They came we up. both thought it was very odd. Why is this van pulling out of there at four in the morning? And why is it following us so closely? Why did it accelerate so quickly? And why did it follow us so close until we got past where the that vehicle was parked? And it kind of did a UE and went back the other direction. So mm-hmm. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Your recollection, and I know it's a long time ago, is that you then drove past the York River Overlook, and you're continuing on to the Coleman Bridge, correct? Yes, to the Coleman Bridge. And the van turns around and heads into what you think is the York River Overlook where Keith's car was found the next day. Right, yes. So I want to pin this down because people have been asking us so many questions about this. So the van is dark colored. Dark colored. Didn't show you any lights or anything to indicate it was a law enforcement vehicle. No, it didn't. And it made no attempt to it pass. Could have been, though. Could yeah. Have been. But they made no attempt to pass you or to pull you over. No. But you did no. think the behavior was unusual enough so that the two of you discussed it. Yes, it was very unusual. And we both discussed it. And I remember remarking to him, look how fast this vehicle is trying to catch up with us. And what's going on with this? That's weird. I know what the speed limit is here. And why is it coming out of the woods like that? Because not only the parkway itself is very isolated. Ringfield parking lot's even more isolated. Yeah. So that's really a, a very isolated area. And I actually think it's closed now. I think it's been closed for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it has been. The Park Service closed it ostensibly because of problems. And they said this in the newspaper because of problems with gay cruising at the Ringfield Plantation site. And most folks these days have never been to Ringfield Plantation because it's been closed for so many years. But it did have a long, Kristen and I estimate it's probably a mile long loop. into this beautiful area that overlooked the York River. But apparently there were problems there, according to the Park Service, with gay cruising, where families would be there picnicking and then there would be cruising activity going on in the restrooms and nearby in the woods. And so there was some conflict between picnickers and people that were engaged in cruising behavior. Interestingly, the National Park Service is not always as forthcoming with information as we know. But in this example, they actually talked about it in the newspapers and were quoted as saying, we're closing this because of problems. Um, I don't think it was just gay cruising. It was a lot. It's a great place to to try to hook up with people. It it was notoriously known for being a gay cruise spot, but it's also um, other straight couples were doing the same thing. And I also think because it was so isolated and so far back, I I think people were also making low-level drug deals, and that was a place you'd go to buy pot and that sort of thing. There are a couple things that are a little bit strange about Ringfield. It's got that mile-long loop. It's paved, but there's only one way in and one way out. The FBI's current theory is that that's actually the site where Kathy and Becky were the night that they were murdered, Mm -hmm. and then Kathy's car was moved later to the Cheetah Mannix Overlook about a mile away. Mm -hmm. So there is a tie-in to Ringfield Plantation in your strange encounter with this dark-colored van. Yes, that's where it came out of. At what point did you all first have contact with the FBI? And, And when you did eventually have contact with the FBI, what were you told about Keith's case in particular? Joy, do you remember how long many days it was? I don't exactly remember, no. What I remember is hearing my aunts and uncles and mom and dad talking about it because they were all around all the time from that point on. 
I remember them talking about it because they were the ones that were really involved in the case at that time and doing everything. The story that I heard at that time was that an FBI agent was driving down the parkway or driving somewhere and heard about it on the radio is how that he got informed. And then he contacted the families, whoever he is. I don't know who it was at that time. That is how they found out about it, not from anybody calling them. Right, right. And it was a couple of days after after the fact. So the case... Okay. The Park Service did a terrible job. But right. after what happened to your sister was about a year and a half prior or a year, that was the talk of the town, unfortunately. And then to have something so close and not call the FBI immediately, that was just... It was pathetic. It really was. They really screwed up the crime scene. They screwed up. There's so much information they probably could have had if they would have done the right thing at the very I beginning. Agree. Never got a good feeling from the um, people who are handling the case through the um, park service. Did the people from the FBI seem more on top of things to your family? Yes, they did. And I, I, it's, I remember this is 1988 and I can remember things that I remember. I, I think dad told us that our phone was being tapped, that they were like around their home. There were some I think there were some FBI agents that were in the area. They obviously didn't have the technology then that we have now. So it was all the stuff my dad was telling me. And I thought, oh, it's interesting. I never thought that would happen to a family like us who they never even locked the doors, never locked the doors on the home. Even if you go at three o'clock in the morning, you know it's going to be unlocked. So I'm sure after this happened, um, I know they started locking the doors. Never imagined something like that would happen. Do you recall if FBI agents came out to meet with your parents at their home in Gloucester? I'm sure they did. I know they did. Yes. There's so many different law enforcement people, but they did. Yeah, they did. I don't know when. It just seemed like from the time that it happened, we were bombarded with FBI or police or, and especially the news media, the news. It was just like, and it seemed like it was like that for a year or two. It and we were very hard. thankful and we're still so thankful for all the news that that yeah. carries these stories. That's the, They're amazing. They're our heroes, actually. How what did, were some of the tips that you all received, both during the early days of the investigation and once it continued to come in later, about Keith and Cassandra, their whereabouts? What are some of the things that, that people came forward to you with? We've talked about it before, Joyce. I know you guys have had a multitude of different tips from people, both very well-meaning, all of them. Right. Um, what are some of the, the things that you remember hearing most about Keith so, and Sandy's disappearance. Are you asking like where their bodies could be? There have been a number of different tips I know on that, but also just what are some theories that people have brought forward about what may have happened to them? Like I, a lot of the same thing. I guess one thread that runs, that's been running the whole time is the law enforcement or imposing as a law enforcement officer. And around here in Gloucester and York County areas, it's generally a lot of people are talking about the same person all the time. And I don't know if I can say the name on here or not, but I think most people know who I'm talking about <laughs> because one of them used to own Liberty Security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other was a, used to be a cop in and, and Newport News. And I'm not sure if he was in Gloucester or not, but I know he was in Newport News. And he supposedly moonlighted with Liberty Security. They were the main ones that I hear over and over. <laughs> How did your county sheriffs get involved? They actually ran a parallel investigation, as I understand it. Do you remember much about that? I know that they had a task force or no, maybe that was the FBI, but I know that there was a task force. They had a, a place over in the in Yorktown in the old motel, the Duke of York Motel, where they had set up a task force. And I think that they were supposed to be sharing information at that point. But I don't think much of that ever really did happen. It was always an issue with the uh, sharing of the information. So between law enforcement agencies, there was some lack of information sharing in the early going. Very much that's so. What I've, that's yes. what I've been told over and over again. Yes. I think they made a lot of mistakes back then. I hope I hope the law enforcement, is, they've learned. So I guess a lot of stuff is computerized. So I guess it crosses over to state police and perhaps FBI and local police. But they were not sharing it. They were not on the same team, it seemed like. And some of it I've heard, and I wasn't in the middle of it then. And I can see this happening. A lot of ego going on between the law enforcement, the different law enforcement. And later on, 
some of the uh, family members got together. And I think it was uh, trying to, there's my dog, <laughs> trying to uh, get answers. And they, it's when they formed that group back, Family Friends Against Crime Today, because they felt like they needed to do something back then. You know? Tell us about the creation of the organization. This is something that the Call family was very much involved in. But I remember it was our, yeah, the Call family, my my Aunt Lou, my Uncle Jimmy, they were very involved. Of course, my father, my mother did wasn't too involved. It was very hard for her. I think the Haley's were involved in that too. I think Brian Pettinger's wife was part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were some other unsolved murders in the area at that time. They were part of it. And I think they were trying to get some laws passed or some things changed in, in Richmond about maybe being able to disclose information and make it more user-friendly for family members, things like that. Yeah, it's my understanding that they actually were able to make some significant strides in Richmond in terms of getting more openness and more information sharing with families regarding what was going on with their cases and that sort of thing at a state level. I remember going through some of my dad's old notes in his briefcase, and I would see letters typed up going to different congressmen or senators or just whoever that they could write to to try to get something done. Even back then, they weren't going to take no for an answer. And your Aunt Lou has been very involved in this, and it continues to be. Are are we correct that Aunt Lou has been a a leader in your family? Oh, she has, yeah. And when this first happened, she had, although she's from Virginia, she had been living in South Carolina for a while, working out there, and she would come home every weekend or every other weekend until she moved back out here when this happened. I don't know if I ever nailed this down. Is Aunt Lou related to your dad or your mom? It's my dad's brother. I mean, sister. (laughs) She's the youngest. (laughs) Yeah, she's the youngest. Out of eight kids, I think. She was the youngest. Joyce and Chris, what are your thoughts about the FBI's handling of this case 33 years on? I've had a lot of different feelings about the FBI and their handling of the case. There were times, I've said this numerous times, earlier on, my dad used to be the one that talked to him all the time and he engaged with them. And then after my dad passed away, there was a little time where nothing was really done. And I would just think all the time, what am I going to do? I need to do something. I didn't know where to, what to do and where to start. And so finally, one day I just picked up the phone and I called up the FBI and I wanted to find out who was handling my brother's case because nobody had contacted us in a couple of years. And they had, they didn't really know. They finally found out and got the information back to me. And it was this FBI agent that I had not heard from. They said his name was Paul Gray. And I don't remember if I ever even spoke to him. I guess what I'm trying to say is there was nothing. We had just been put in a little, in a pile and they were hoping that we were just going to go away. Fast forward a little bit further. And then is when we started the Facebook page and the family started getting together again. And we started putting some pressure on it. And we started getting a little bit of action again. All in all, like when it first happened, I had hope because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the FBI. They're the best at everything. And I was really to be upbeat about anything. I was upbeat about that. But that went away fast because... For one thing, I get in my mind, I understand that they can't tell us a lot of things. But on the other hand, it's been 33 damn years. What in the world? uh, People are dying. Family members are dying. And why can't they tell us something at this point? And so today, it really it really gets to me. I'm aggravated. I think that they should come forth more and talk to the families and give them some answers if they know something that might help. Because what have we, it's 33 years. Anyway, so <laughs> you get how I feel today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I feel, I think that the FBI could have done a much better job with this case if the Park Service had not ruined the crime scene. I think they would have been way ahead and they might have been able to solve the case if the Park Service had not even taken the clothes out of the car and put them back and messed with the whole thing. That's just too weird. Why would someone even do that? No, that is true. I agree. That is too, what's weird. Anyone with any common sense would know better than to do that, unless you're trying to cover your tracks or something. Tell the, <laughs> tell the story of the clothes being removed from Keith's Toyota. All I remember from it is that my father was the one who, and he actually spotted the car on his way to work. I think it was a sunny, it was a sunny morning. He was running late, but he recognized the car and he pulled over and he 
looked in the car and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. He did not see any clothes in the car at all. I don't think the keys or nothing was in there. And he was in a hurry and he thought, well, they went out on a date and maybe they're just doing whatever teenagers doing and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. So he continued on the work. And then when the park service found the same and they um, went back to the car that the, the belongings were in there and they were in, in, in such a, they were put in the car that like they said, like keys were in the ignition and the clothes were put where if you walked by the car and looked in the window, you, you would have been able to see it. My father didn't see any of them when he was there earlier that morning. So weird. It's very weird. Do you think there's any chance that your father being in a hurry to get to work at Anheuser-Busch, and that was his normal commute along the parkway, correct? Every yeah. day. Do you think there's any chance that your father would have looked in the Toyota and not seen the clothes in the back seat, along with Keith's glasses and other items that were on the shift console? Do you think there's any way he could have missed those things? Hey, Joy, wasn't it true that he, he said he opened the car door and the keys were not in the, in the ignition at that time. Because if you open the car door, it would have made that ding, ding sound. You know, the keys were in the ignition. And so when he opened the door, if I'm not mistaken, it was not making that sound. So the keys were not there at that time. And if I'm not mistaken, the, when the park service said they found the car, that the keys were in the ignition. So maybe even if he didn't see the clothes, he would have heard the car making the car door making the noise. Yeah, I personally, I, I think if my dad looked around that car and if something like his son's clothes he would have noticed right off it's like why are my son's clothes balled up in the back of the car why aren't they on <laughs> and, and it was odd on? because it wasn't even all of like her clothes it was like just some of her clothes like one of uh-huh. her boots and her purse was open and yeah. then i think all of Keith's clothes were there and but not I, all of hers yeah i like, assure you he wouldn't have been driving on to work he would have been freaking out but that wasn't the case. And then later on, as the case went on a little bit further, just to make sure he somebody from the police department or some law, some agency, he was hypnotized just to, they found, no, he didn't see any clothes in that car. Let's stay with this for a second. Your father, Richard Call, which is why Keith goes by Keith and not Richard to avoid confusion. So Keith goes by his middle name, but your dad, underwent hypnosis to go over the details of what he would have subconsciously remembered. He did. He did. What were the results of the hypnosis? Did anything come out of it that was different from what your dad had remembered? No. And I have the paperwork. I've seen it. I've looked at it and no, nothing. It's pretty, pretty normal, a normal reaction. If you're stopping and you see your son or daughter's vehicle on the road, that you're going to look pretty closely to see if anything's out of the ordinary. Now, he might have thought, just turned 19, maybe the story I heard was maybe that my dad was a little aggravated because what is he's usually a responsible kid. Why is he leaving his car there? Who would he go off with? It was kind of like the impression that I got. He went on his way, not thinking that anything ever like this to happen to his son. There was not that kind of red flag. He just thought he was being, he stayed out and maybe went somewhere with some other kids or something. And your dad was certain it was Keith's Toyota. It was a pretty distinctive car. It was a maroon color. And it had his license plates, Keith's on it. K-E-I-F-S. Uh-huh. Oh, so it had the vanity plate. He's 100% certain it's his son's car and there's nothing out of the ordinary. And do you think if Keith's wallet and glasses, and as Chris said, the ignition keys were there, your dad would have noticed those things. Oh, I do. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Now, the Haley sisters have come up with a new idea just recently yeah. that I'd never heard before, and Kristen and I thought it was very interesting. Mm-hmm. We were talking to Paula and Terry the other day, and they said they wondered if the National Park Service Rangers, who were the people that supposedly removed the clothing from the car, and then after finding out that there was a missing persons case involved here, supposedly they came back and put the clothes back in the Toyota, further compromising what Chris has said should have been thought of as a crime scene. The Haley sisters came up with a new theory, which is they were wondering if the Park Service Rangers were doing this to bust chops taking the clothing, assuming that these kids were skinny dipping or something, and that they were actually doing this to be mean-spirited. Does that make sense? Do they really think that those kids are going to be out there skinny dipping in 30, 40 degree water? In April? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Any of that's possible, but I still think that those Rangers had something to do with it. And they realized they made a big mistake by testing with the clothes and they decided they better put them back. I don't know. It was just too weird. Yeah, I wasn't there when Chris got there. He was there before me. But that's one thing that first off that that has never changed. And I believe Chris because this has stuck with him all these years about how eerie it, it was with the park rangers that day. And he's never not felt like that. He's always talked about that, about how that feeling was, about the way that the park ranger was acting so strange. It's always, you've always felt like that, haven't you? And is this the same park ranger, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, who they transferred to Shenandoah Valley, who obviously there was another murder of a lesbian couple out there too, about 10 years after that, or I don't know if that was the same park ranger, but I know they transferred one or two of them out there. Join us again next time on Mind Over Murder as we continue our conversation with Chris Call and Joyce Call Canada, brother and sister of Keith Call, We'll continue our conversation. They'll answer your questions on the disappearance of Keith Call and Cassandra Haley and probe the mysteries of the Colonial Parkway murders. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. Mm-hmm.